conquest opened the gates of England to a plethora of lords and noblemen from Normandy. One of these men was Robert Mallet, a powerful nobleman and landowner in the late 11th century. As the country was divvied up in accordance to the Doomsday Book, a variety of lands were given to Robert. This included a coastal area of land in Suffolk, East Anglia, in which Robert Mallet founded the town of Orford in 1100 AD. The medieval town was situated close to the sea next to a long spit of land known now as Orford Ness, which provided a natural breakwater so the townsfolk were able to build a large sheltered harbour which soon expanded and played a key role in East Anglia's success as a thriving trading county. Various other prosperous harbours and ports also began sprouting up all along the East Anglian coast, namely Walberswick, Ipswich, Great Yarmouth, Cofife, and one of the largest of all, Dunwich, just north of Orford. It is thanks to these busy trading ports that we see the surviving remnants of an unimaginably rich and powerful region in England. Grand churches, ruinous remains of giant abbeys and priories, and monumentally ornate cathedrals are dotted all across the counties of Norfolk, Suffolk and Essex, a clear sign of the region's influence and wealth. Malay, however, would not witness this prosperity for long, as he died in 1105 AD, and his lands were passed over to the Crown of England. King Henry I gave Orford to his nephew, Stephen de Blois, in 1113 AD. The king died two decades later in 1135, and, just before passing, named Stephen as the next King of England. This caused much tension and disagreement throughout England, as Henry's only surviving heir, Matilda, was next in line to be crowned following Henry's death. This soon boiled over into all-out civil war, as Matilda was able to summon an army capable of challenging King Stephen. Things escalated as the Earl of Suffolk, Hugh Bygard, an incredibly rich and powerful nobleman who owned the majority of lands in East Anglia at the time, sided with Matilda and subsequently waged war on the new King of England as well. Although most definitely a key player during the Civil War, known now as the Anarchy, Bygard made a vital mistake when he received word that Stephen had been taken ill and passed away, so the eager nobleman took this opportunity to lay siege to Norwich Castle, which was still under development at the time. Norwich was the capital of East Anglia, and a very rich city indeed, known for its thriving markets, merchant quarters, many guilds, and heavy monastic presence. It is assumed that Hugh Bygood hoped to use this civil war to his favour, effectively using it as an excuse for land grabbing. Therefore, taking over occupancy of Norwich, a fine city, would be the new centrepiece of his own little empire within England. Unfortunately for Bygood, the news of the king's passing was indeed premature, and Stephen subsequently made a speedy recovery from his sickness. Soon after, the king sent a relief force to besiege the recently conquered castle of Norwich, and Hugh was forced to surrender and devote his loyalty to the king. Bygood went with Stephen to Lincolnshire and took part in the First Battle of Lincoln, but deserted the king as he was being captured. After effectively switching sides again back to Matilda, she granted Bygood the Earldom of Norfolk and was made Constable of Norwich Castle, the same castle he had recently just besieged. At this stage of the war, it is noted that Hugh, now Earl of both Norfolk and Suffolk, took a stance of armed neutrality for the remainder of the Civil War. This is believed to be because Matilda's son, Henry II, succeeded Stephen in 1154 as the new King of England, and began the construction of a royal castle inside the Suffolk town of Orford. This extensive fortress was not only placed strategically in the heart of Bygood's territory, but was also built on land that, at the time, was owned by the famous Thomas Becker, a highly influential archbishop of whom Henry had recently fallen out with due to a disagreement regarding the king's power and the church. Hugh Bygood was known as quite the troublemaker during his lifetime, often playing a vital role in several arguments and subsequent rebellions against the crown of England, usually due to his disagreement in various limits of power imposed on noblemen by the king. Unfortunately for the Earl of Suffolk and Norfolk, all these rebellions were unsuccessful and Bygood died in Palestine in either 1176 or 1177 AD, after being effectively exiled from England. In 1173, a new uprising was brewing, 
as Henry II's own sons began a rebellion against him. The incomplete castle at Orford was quickly finished in preparation for a probable siege, however this civil war was short-lived and subsequently petered out just before the castle could see any action. For the remainder of the 12th century, Orford Castle was used as a royal residence, passing to King Richard I in 1189, who never actually visited the castle during the entirety of his 10-year reign, due to either being away in France or on crusade in the Holy Lands for the vast majority of his time being King of England. The medieval keeper Orford was rather unique, featuring a round circular tower with three rectangular towers all built with fine precision in mind. The castle had a curtain wall, also made of stone, with probably four towers and a gatehouse, which had a bridge over a dry ditch which encircled the walls. There are many features within Orford Castle which suggest it was not really built with military use in mind. To name a few, the buttresses create many blind spots, which would make defending the castle quite difficult, and the bailey walls were built very close to the keep itself meaning there was not much room for a garrison to be safely stationed within the castle grounds. Modern scholars believe that the artistic design of the architecture suggests that the castle was built with the Theodosian walls of Constantinople in mind, which at the time of this castle's construction was an idealised image of power for the medieval nobility. In 1216, the French invaded England under the leadership of Prince Louis of France. They took over multiple castles all around England, some castles voluntarily opening their doors to the invading French, as they were owned by the rebellious barons who had taken up arms against King John, and some were laid siege upon and taken over by force. The French army laid siege to Orford Castle and successfully took it over later in 1216, however were soon pushed out again after their long, arduous siege of the formidable Dover Castle failed, and, after suffering heavy losses, the French were pushed back into their ships and, while crossing the English Channel back to France, were again attacked and suffered further losses in a devastating naval defeat. Following the aftermath of the Barons' Rebellion and subsequent French invasion, John Fitzrobert became the newly appointed Governor of Orford Castle under the reign of King Henry III, and was later replaced by Hubert de Burr, the constable of Dover Castle during the two sieges in 1216. When Edward I came to power, the castle again changed ownership to Robert de Ufford, who was the Earl of Suffolk and owned the nearby castle of Ufford, to which unfortunately nothing now survives. The Ufford family took great care in modernising the castle, adding glass to the many windows and improved the status of many rooms with the addition of wood panelling. The panels would have been painted in striking colours such as red, green, gold and white, and would have featured many painted decorations along the various tapestries to fill every inch of the medieval rooms with colour, making it a feast for the eyes. Despite the somewhat grandeur makeover, the Uffords rarely used the castle at Orford, and as such, the money spent on the castle significantly declined over the next few generations. At the same time, the seaside port of Orford was also experiencing a catastrophe of its own. The tidal currents had been pushing more and more sand across the shallow waters along the coastline in a process known as longshore drift, and this was causing the harbour area to silt up. Merchant ships could no longer use the port as a viable docking space, so were forced to trade at other coastal settlements. This was true of many East Anglian ports throughout the 14th century, Longshore drift, coupled with particularly ferocious coastal storms, were plummeting many seaside trading hubs into jeopardy. The constant battering of the waves against the soft, sandy cliffs were causing coastal erosion on an apocalyptic scale. Indeed, the city of Dunwich, one of the most prosperous and thriving medieval market ports in all of Britain, fell into the sea in just a few short decades. Dunwich was one of the largest cities in East Anglia, on par with other major regional settlements such as Kings Lynn and Bury St Edmunds. The entire city was swallowed up by the sea within a century. The only surviving medieval feature is the ruinous remains of Dunwich Friary, built outside of the city walls. This too shall be gone within a few hundred years. 
The additional sediment crashing into the sea by the relentless coastal erosion occurring all across the coastline of East Anglia sped up the silting process in the many ports. Walberswick, Covehife, Orford, Blytheborough and many others were all having to redirect their trade routes at a heavy cost. Now that much of East Anglia's income was taken away through the closure of the many ports, it began to rely much more on its secondary income, religion. Due to King Henry VIII's dissolution of the Monasteries Act in the 1530s, this source of income too was taken away, and the prosperity of East Anglia was plunged into a steep decline. In 1600, we see the earliest depiction of Orford Castle, however the large scar where the gatehouse stands is an evident sign of disrepair and neglect. Under the ownership of the Stanhope family in 1604, they built a new home at Sudbourne, where it is believed that the stone from the castle was quarried out and used for the new building's construction. In the early 1800s, the castle's current owners, the Seymour Conway family, proposed for the demolition of the castle in its entirety. However, the government refused on the basis that the castle posed a valuable landmark for sailors wanting to avoid the nearby sandbanks along the coast. A few decades later, in 1831, Francis Seymour Conway undertook a conservation effort by installing a new roof and replaced the upper floor, using it as a guest house. Despite the conservation efforts, however, the bailey walls continued to be quarried out right down to the foundations, leaving the rather Martian landscape surrounding the castle that we see today. During World War II, Orford Castle was used as a radar emplacement, with heavy equipment installed in the southeastern tower, which required a strong concrete floor to be added in order to support this 20th century military hardware. A video archiving the history of Orford Castle could not be complete without mentioning the tale of the Wild Man. In the early 13th century, chronicler Ralph of Coggeshall wrote of a naked man, covered from head to toe in long, wild hair, being caught in the nets of local fishermen in 1167 AD. The strange man was taken back to the castle and was held prisoner in the castle's cellars, reportedly being questioned who he was, where he came from, and why he was here. However, the man never responded with as much as a single word. Superstitious of the wild man's feral behaviour, the guards in the castle keep regress to torture in an attempt to get some answers, or at least a simple word, from the elusive wild man. After six months of questioning and torture, the wild man mysteriously escaped. No more sightings of the mystical figure were ever reported again, but the legend quickly travelled throughout East Anglia, with many believing he returned back to the sea from whence he came. This legend sparked a tradition of wild man carvings in monastic architecture all across the coastal areas of the region, with as many as 20 carvings featured on baptismal fonts around Norfolk and Suffolk alone. I hope you've enjoyed today's video. I have touched upon many subjects which already feature in other videos I have made on this channel, such as the Siege of Dover, the Fall of Dunwich, and the history of Norwich through medieval churches. I've left a link to these videos in the description below, so feel free to check them out. Until then, thanks for watching.